You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI podcast. Conventional investment strategies are changing. Gone are the days of investing in real estate strictly off of pro forma spreadsheets. The new market landscape has many investors reevaluating their portfolios and looking for the best place to passively earn a safe, consistent return. The Dual City Advantage Fund is an evergreen 506C open ended fund that specializes in investing in commercial real estate. Dual City's ideal investor is an accredited investor who wants a portion of their portfolio in passive and diverse real estate investments without having the high risks of a single syndication. The Dual City Advantage Fund is outpacing public REIT ETFs by more than double, and while the rest of the market has been in flux, it has delivered consistent quarterly returns to its investors since its inception. To learn more about Dual City's value, strategies, and long-term vision, visit www.dualcityinvestments.com slash Tom or call 846-757-2429. Again, that's www.dualcityinvestments.com slash Tom or call 864-757-2429. Robert, thanks for joining us today. Would you be able to give our listeners a little bit of information on your background? For over 20 years, I was a special agent with IRS criminal investigations. IRS has a law enforcement function. It's about 2,500 employees out of about 70 or 80,000 employees. They're what they call the gun toters. They're actually the ones that are on par with Secret Service, DEA, FBI, Homeland Security. And their job are, is to chase tax evaders and money launderers around the world. And particularly right now, they're dealing with cryptocurrency in a lot of ways. Uh, but I did that for over over 20 years and retired about two years ago, decided to do something else. And I started a CPA firm that just focuses on forensic accounting and tax resolution. Forensic accounting is really accounting in court. So bankruptcy court hires me, divorce lawyers, people with partnership disputes. When someone's stealing money from another person, I come in and find out where the money come from, where the money go to, who did it, how much how it was done. That's what I do. So before we dive into all of that, I have a really important question. What are your thoughts on Miami? <laughs> Miami? <laughs> mean living there? Yeah, man. Yeah. Or like, visiting so, there. You know, visiting for, there. For all, of our, for all of our like listeners, we, we were talking about it beforehand. I have a thousand dollar bet with Tom that he won't move out of Long Island before September 1st. And he's got to move like to South Florida because that was I what think, the bet was about. I think it was a sign lease. And I'm feeling, I, don't listen to him. I'm feeling pretty confident because <laughs> if you're a longtime listener, you know that we've had this conversation for years. So September 1st is the deadline. You know, like, I think I'm going to throw a party in Raleigh if you want to come with Tom's $1,000 that he's going to give me. <laughs> oh, well, the, you know, you can have a picture and have a podcast about him handing you the cash. Oh. <laughs> That's right. You can you can, you can do it that way. You know, Miami, I guess, is fine to visit, but man, I've been there. It's like a concrete jungle. I, you just couldn't pay me to live in that place like that. I'm just not enthused about it. I, I don't like the pizzazz. I don't like the the way. It, you know, I, I don't like any of it. I mean, the beach. That's, that's Tom's vibe, though, that's, man. But that's about Rolexes, it. Bentleys. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it just doesn't do anything for me after a while. I was like, yeah, so what? <laughs> go, go find somewhere a little different, like a uh, little Key West. You know, your own little spot in the in the swamps Dude, somewhere. Key West would be sweet. You'd have to learn how to sail. Yes, oh, yes. Do that. Go to. Uh, I'd count Canada, it. I, I'd count it. Or the, what they yeah. call the Redneck Riviera. That's Pensacola, Destin, that area. You know, top Destin's of the PM sweet. handle. A lot of our yeah. clients invest in Destin. So yeah, yeah. Anything yeah, yeah. with no income tax is great. Well, that's one of the primary motivators, plus the weather. So you know, I'm gonna what do you call it? I'm gonna be doing three months down there. That's the plan: September, October, November. So it's not a permanent thing necessarily. We'll see um, how it goes. But if it's not going to be Miami, it will be somewhere in in the Florida area where I'll where I'll I probably end up. So we shall You're see. You're one out of many of what they call them Yankees coming down to Florida. Oh yeah, no, I definitely yes. am, and I'm, yes, I have plans to snowbird too. I already have the plans laid out. It's just about it's a matter of execution now. So that's the stage I'm in. It's execution. Like I said, lots of plans, no execution. I feel pretty confident. <laughs> so if you have to give me a thousand bucks, I will never let you live it down. I'll bring it up on this podcast from time to time, just to remind everybody. <laughs> yeah, it has to happen. So. All right. So I'll let everybody know how Miami is um, uh, <laughs> on like the next podcast episode where we go. So. Moving back to to the podcast. So, Robert, you worked in criminal investigations. How do criminal investigations and audits kind of tie in together? Well, there is a couple of ways in which an IRS criminal investigator gets his case or her case. 
their job actually is to keep their plate full. One of them is called a fraud referral. A fraud referral is when the civil side of IRS sees something that's suspicious in nature and then throws it over the wall to the criminal side. Uh, so that's, that's what they call a fraud referral. And it comes in many forms. For the most part, it's a collection issue. For example, if someone owes the IRS some money, then when the IRS starts to collect, it's typical for individuals to start moving money around. Oh, I don't own that uh, boat anymore. I gave it to my brother. Or they put it into a nominee name. So when a revenue, what they call revenue officers, go out there and try to collect, you know, squeeze that rock to get the blood out, right? Uh, many times individuals will start moving assets or lying about their income and their assets. And so when that happens, that is fraud. And that's technically tax evasion when someone actually is lying about their income or assets knowingly, willfully. And so the IRS goes after them there, then. So that's when it, that's when it starts to come in from a, from an audit perspective into a criminal investigation perspective. It's for the most part, it's a tax due and owing and willfulness. Willfulness is not transposing a number. It's not making an honest mistake. It's not giving it to your return prepared and your return prepared makes a mistake. It's an intentional act where someone actually wants to don't want to pay taxes and takes what they call overt acts or overt steps in order to hide that fact to the IRS. Got it. Got it. So that's, I guess, an important thing to understand for listeners of the show. Fraud isn't necessarily just a mistake that you make. It's you're intentionally taking actions towards hiding stuff for tax evasion to not pay taxes. Right. And, and remember, the, the audience for a criminal investigation is 10 or 12 people who may or may not have college degrees sitting in a jury box determining whether someone's guilty or not. So they really have to, some people call it dumb it down. I like to be the more politically correct called simplify. You have to simplify the facts to where anyone in a jury box can understand what's going on and agree with the prosecution that they shouldn't be acting this way. And willfulness is rarely what they call direct evidence. Willfulness is rarely an email going, please do this because I'm hiding it from the IRS. It doesn't happen that way. That email rarely ever exists. It's usually what they call indirect evidence or circumstantial evidence, which means taking the whole picture, you can see what they're trying to evade taxes. For example, the amount of money. If it's $5, is it technically tax evasion? Yeah, but the IRS is not interested in going after $5. It's going to be the fifty thousand, five hundred thousand, five million dollars. It has to be over typically over a period of time. So it wasn't just a one year mistake. It was the last five years that did the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's lying to the return preparer. Oh yeah, uh, I forgot to give you that bank statement. You know when they found that later on, that type of thing. So there's a pattern of behavior to where anyone sitting in the jury box would look at that and say. Yeah, they know exactly what they're doing. It was just not a mistake. It wasn't a one-off type of thing or a misunderstanding of the tax law, too. Criminal is pretty serious, obviously. What about on the audit side? Have you, in your career, did you participate in a bunch of audits? No, I did not. There is a reason why criminal investigation does not intermingle with the audit, with the civil side. And the reason being is because the IRS has two functions, a civil side and a, and a criminal investigation side. There's some case law out there that says they don't want the public to misunderstand, is this a civil issue or a criminal issue? Because a criminal issue, you have a Fifth Amendment right, two things, right? But in a civil issue, you don't. So the revenue officer says, given the information, you're required to give them the information. But if it's a criminal issue, you have a Fifth Amendment right where you don't have to give information to them. So if there is a criminal investigation actively going on, the civil side has to stay out of it they are barred from really doing anything else and let the criminal side do its job. And in addition, you don't want a criminal investigator doing an interview and then turn right around and have a civil guy do the same interview two days later. And then you have conflicting statements. Well, you got to put both of those statements to give to the defense during discovery to show your whole case file. And you don't want your witness saying one thing to one person, one thing to another person as well. Got it. Got it. So when we turn to the real estate side of things, what are some issues that real estate investors you know, need to be aware of in regards to when they might run afoul of a criminal or run into an instance where a civil case might become a criminal investigation? 
Well, in some ways, the typical investor probably won't have the problem. But I have seen on multiple occasions where real estate is used to hide the asset. They will quit claim deed it to somebody else or try to hide it that way. They will actually, some cases, do a fake second mortgage or a fake lien on the property. So the IRS looks at it and goes, oh, there's no equity in here to take. When they find out there is equity all along, they just gave a false second mortgage to somebody else. I've seen that happen as well. Uh, I've seen them put it in nominee names where they would supposedly sell it to a third party. But that third party is actually them or controlled by a girlfriend or controlled by the mom or dad and that type of thing. That's usually where I see real estate being used as a vehicle to hide some of their assets, and some of their income. So not only is it real estate used as a vehicle to hide things, it's also real estate investors have come afoul by not reporting all the income. So depending on the type of real estate you're in, some people are what we call slumlords, right? They have a lot of lower income individuals, a lot of houses, and these individuals are in a cash lifestyle, so they get paid in cash. And they don't report all that to the, uh, to the Internal Revenue Service. Or they take their deductions and overstate, overstate the deductions. Uh, that's, that's another common area of things where, oh, it's repairs. When actually it's repair on their own personal house, but they decided to go ahead and put the repairs on the rental side of the house, the rental side of the equation for the tax returns. That would also be considered a false tax return and potentially tax evasion as well. Right, so this is kind of sounds like it might come down to some record keeping for some people, right? Like, and uh, in in cases where there's some people just you know, say they're what's the word we're looking for? I don't want to use the word negligent, although that that could be the word for it. Um, in when they're actually doing their bookkeeping and handling their records, they might accidentally miscategorize something into real estate, you know, into their like investment property that might have been done on their personal property. Is is merely doing that? Is that like a mistake, or is it like you said earlier, where like if it's done routinely, is that when it enters the the, the realm of a criminal investigation? You use the right word, accidentally. Accidentally is not criminal intent. If they did the same thing over and over and over. They have a 2,000 square foot house. Now it's a 10,000 square foot house and they built it over a five year period of time. And all the, you know, trips to Lowe's and Home Depot and all the, you know, the uh, new kitchen cabinets that came in, that came into the, that were purchased all went to the new house. A jury would understand over a four year period of time. You can't do that stuff. You know, misclassifying a toilet that you put in your house that you claim as a rental expense. That's such a small thing. It's not going to make a difference. But those bigger purchases will over a period of time with criminal intent. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's not just one off instances that are, are no. a mere accident. It's actual intentionally doing this over and over again. Um, I guess a follow up question to that is you know, sometimes, you know, we have accounting and tax professionals that work with their investors or work with their clients, how can tax and accounting professionals make sure that they aren't complicit or don't get roped into these types of issues with their clients? Well, from the return preparer side, just ask the right questions. Hey, do you have all the expenses? You know, we all know that return preparers by nature are not auditors. They're supposed to do some some level of due diligence to make sure the numbers are correct, but they're not auditors. They're not required to be auditors, but they need to do at least ask the right questions. And as long as they ask the right questions and put the information on the, on the return, they're going to be fine. What happens is, is that if the real estate investor lies to the return preparer and the return preparer does put down false information, that return preparer is not going to be liable because they didn't intentionally do it, you know, do it, commit a crime. It's the client that did the crime by not telling the return preparer all the information. But here's the key. If the return preparer knows what's going on, for example, hey, do you claim all your rent? And the client says, nah, I didn't claim this $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 a year in rent. Don't put it down. And the return preparer just says, yeah, sure, I won't do that. Now the return preparers put themselves in a conspiracy, but they're also committing a tax crime as well. So as long as you, as long as the return preparer puts down information that was given to them by the client, they're golden. It's when they know something that should have been on there, but don't put it on there on purpose. Right, right. For people who are listening out there, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, uh, there's no attorney client privilege with CPAs, right? So like you can't tell them something in confidence, right? If they know the information, they could potentially be pulled in, in a criminal investigation, right? 
That is correct. Uh, under criminal laws, the attorney-client privilege does not apply to CPAs. That does not happen. But when I interviewed individuals, many times I'd have to, if we had a, a, a tax case on a, on a client, right? Client A. It could be a plumber, it could be a real estate investor, you name it. Uh, one of the key witnesses I would have is the is return preparer, because many of them use return preparers. So I had to go to return preparer and ask them a lot of detailed question. Who gave you the information? Where is it at? Show me the documentation you received. Trace it to me for me on the tax return so I can see what you did. In almost every case, I found the CPA or the return preparer did something wrong. Wrong by mistake, not by intention. Uh, so that I have to at least overcome that issue that maybe the client's 95% wrong and the return preparer is 5% wrong, but the 95% is going to carry the day in the court situation, you know, because they're the ones that are complicit in this whole thing. Um, I've had, I've had that happen plenty of times. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so it sounds like if, if the, if the tax return preparer, if they, if they take the right steps, ask the right questions, they do their part in the due diligence process and they're, then they're protecting themselves for the most part. They're protected because it's the clients. When the client's supplying the information, it's really on the client at that point. The tax preparer is just putting the information that they got from the client onto the return. They're just filing with the information they, they received. Correct. Correct. As long as they file what the what the client gave to them, they should be just fine. They should Dang be it. just fine. And just like it's like anything else, you know, uh, when you get when you get that uh, document, you scan it in, you keep it in your work papers. You know, so something ever happens. Uh, later on down the road, when there's an Irish criminal investigator with a gun and a badge starts knocking on the door, when they interview the interview the CPA, the CPA pops up and says this information. So I got it, and I can trace the information I got to the to return for you. How long should CPAs keep that information? They're required to keep it for uh, a few years because the IRS can only go back, uh, I think, three years for an audit or two years for an audit, but they can go back six years if it's unreported income over twenty five percent. But it's also unlimited civilly for any criminal fraud issue. However, that's a civil issue. From a criminal standpoint, six years. So should six CPAs years. keep documentation for six years? Yeah. So six years yeah. you should be you should be you should be well, you should be fine. Yeah. Now you guys were talking earlier about attorney client privilege. Can you explain the significance of that? as it pertains to CPAs versus attorneys and like the IRS's role in collecting information? From a criminal standpoint, there are federal rules regarding what they call privileged communications. That is a overarching umbrella. There's a privileged communication between a parishioner and a priest in a confession setting that that's, that's cannot be brought in the court. There's what we call pillow talk between one spouse and the other. That's also privileged communication. There's a privileged communication between an individual and a psychiatrist. Also in that setting, it can be as well. But there's also privileged communication between a an attorney and a client. There is that attorney-client privilege communication as well. There's like four or five of them that are out there that you can't bring into court. Okay. But there is none for an attorney for a CPA in a criminal setting to have a CPA client uh, privileged communication. The only way that a CPA can be considered privileged in a criminal investigation is if the CPA is working for the attorney on behalf of a client. That's what we call a COBEL, K-O-V-E-L. And that is when the CPA is directly hired by the attorney to help the attorney evaluate the criminal setting, determine what next steps should be taken. So they are allowed to hire CPAs. And that's how I get hired quite often. I think about 90, 95% of my clientele are attorneys. They hire me directly to help them navigate the minefield, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, of course, ultimately, the client's going to pay the bill, right? The attorney's not going to pay the bill. The client's going to pay the bill. But I work, I have a contract with the attorney. So anything that I say to the attorney or anything that we talk about with the client is all privileged communications. What does privileged communications do to you? Like if you if you're interacting with your CPA and you don't have privileged communications, how does that potentially expose somebody? Well, it exposes. Well, it, it just puts whatever you say uh, or do uh, puts the CPA right square as a witness in a trial. That's all. That's really what it does. So if if you if an individual says something to a CPA 
just realize in a criminal setting, it's just not privileged. Whatever you say, jokingly or not jokingly, it's just it's just the CPA has to get up on the witness stand and tell the truth. Yeah, that's how that's how that works. Yeah. So basically, the, the bottom line is be, 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 just realize that for everybody out there who's listening to this, if you're a real estate investor, you're a business owner, whatever the case may be, you're a taxpayer. Um, that the conversations you're having with your CPAs are not privileged, and if you um, if you if you tell them that you did something fraudulent, then they they might not be able to help you because now all of a sudden they're on the hook too. So, um, correct. Just, just something to be aware of because I know sometimes people people have asked before, like, wait, we have a there's there's a CPA client privilege, right? No, and and clearly there's not here. So there is any civil issue in advising your client regarding tax matters. There is an attorney client privilege from a civil standpoint. Okay. That does exist in the IRS. That's not a problem. It's that if it's a criminal issue or there's fraud involved, then there is no attorney client privilege. So the bottom line is, is an investor goes to their CPA and says, I committed fraud. Well, your goose is cooked. That's what it is. But if an investor wants to go to a CPA and say, Hey, what's the best way where I can shelter some of this money or get the biggest tax deduction? Or what about this and what about that? That would be privileged communications. It's all civil issues. No fraud involved. It's just tax advice. That's privileged civilly. But in criminal, it doesn't exist. No shape or form. Got it. Got it. So is there any like stories you have about real estate investors where they have gotten in trouble that can maybe help the audience just kind of stay clear of those types of situations um, so they don't find themselves in hot water? I had a case early in my career where I had a real estate investor that was flipping properties and lawfully, you know, they'd, they'd buy a property for $20,000, put $5,000 in it and sell for 50, right? Typical property flip. The issue came into play where, first of all, the investor didn't file a tax return. Well, that's a problem, right? And they were doing millions of dollars in sales every year. They just didn't file a tax return at all and took most of the money out in cash. So all the prop, you know, the closing check comes in, right? It's a huge closing check. Let's say fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars. It gets deposited into the into the uh, the corporate checking account, and then out of that, you get all your, you know, your construction bills. You got to pay, and you know, office staff and everything else. But then what did he do? He took the balance of it, the rest of it, out in his cash, for the most part. He just write a check up for nine thousand dollars and just cash it, and he would just, you know, wine, women, and song. He liked his drinking, he liked his gambling, he liked, he liked to just play around. So the issue wasn't really wasn't the real estate industry. It was him just not buying a tax return at all on his uh, property flips. And he ultimately got a couple of years in prison. But something else he added to the equation was he was also helping his buyers go out there and commit bank fraud by falsifying their income and their credit histories. So he would get people to qualify for loans that weren't even supposed to be qualified for it. So not only was he selling, in a sense, a crappy house that wasn't really up to par, but should be, he was also getting people to get loans that they didn't qualify for. So it was a double whammy, you know, so um, tax evasion and ultimately bank fraud and HUD fraud. Are you looking for a law firm that can handle your real estate transactions with expertise and efficiency? Thrasher Law Offices is a premier boutique law firm specializing in real estate acquisitions, private placement syndications, debt and equity financings, and corporate transactions. Their team of experienced attorneys understands the complexities of real estate transactions from purchase agreements to fund offerings and everything in between. Thrasher Law Offices advises their clients on structuring transactions for real estate development acquisitions, debt and equity financings, commercial leasings, and has extensive experience in private placement syndications, helping businesses raise capital through private offerings. Thresher Law Offices builds long-term relationships with the clients they serve, creating strategies and opportunities not just for today, but for your future needs as well. With their knowledge and expertise, you can trust that Thresher Law Offices will guide you through the legal process with ease and confidence as you make critical decisions that will shape the future of your business. Visit www.thresherpllc.com to learn more and schedule a free consultation. Again, to learn more and schedule a free consultation, visit www.thresherpllc.com. The link will also be in the show notes, but for right now, we'll dive right back into today's episode. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because we, everyone in a while, we get somebody that's coming through our sales pipeline and they're a flipper or builder or developer, small time shop and uh, mm -hmm. very messy. And they're like, I need to back file a bunch of tax returns that I haven't filed. I tend to give the benefit of the doubt and uh, think that, you know, these people just 
they're just so busy that they forget to do it. But I, I think this is really good to understand how that this people, is like, Brandon, how can people, I, don't know, man. I, I just think, I think some they're of these guys are just so messy and they're just so adults like adults running around unsupervised. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows you got to pay taxes. It's just that yeah. they, they don't want to do it one year and they get behind like, ah, who wants to do that? And they next yeah. year is like, ah, oh, I don't want to do that like now. If I, if well, I, I remember we, we took one of those guys on and it was so hard. I don't know how you guys did it on your end because like it was so hard to go back through multiple years of information and try to build P&Ls that we felt comfortable with yeah. tax returns for it. So we don't, we don't do that anymore because of that experience. But I mean, there's people running around out there that just, they don't have a bookkeeping system. They don't file taxes. And it's typically flippers. It's typically it's actually typically people that are doing the property levels that you were talking about uh, when yeah, we see crossover. Maybe desk. a there may be a habit forming type of things out there where people just you know they go by the seat of their pants and they go by the seat of their pants both of property flipping as well as just record keeping. You know that's just how they operate. And there's been a couple of them after like that that I've investigated that were just. It, real estate was either used to hide the asset or used to generate the income that frankly wasn't taxed and never was reported properly. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, have you seen Ozark? I have not. The show? You know the synopsis? I Was it the... Um, Jason it, Bateman. He's like, like a wealth manager for the cartel and he goes out to the Ozarks and basically launders money. Anyway, th I, there's a scene in that mm -hmm. that I've never been able to wrap my mind around and I'm just okay. curious as to your take. So there's a scene where he's building, I believe it's a church but the church never like the idea is to never actually complete the church. And okay. so somehow he's like laundering money through construction costs. How does something like that work? Construction costs, okay, the money laundering 101 is taking bad money and turning it to make it look like good money. That's just money laundering 101 in its simplest form. So what evidently he's doing is, it could be as simple as, they're not even doing money laundering right, okay? You may sit there and say, well, this making any sense, and it may not make any sense because it's TV. They may not even have a money launderer expert <laughs> to help with the script. Uh, but there are ways in which the money can come in, the dirty money can come in, right? And when it comes in, it's got to change form. It's got to change what, so you change it in the form of lumber or labor. And then you put that toward something that you're trying to hide or you're changing the form of the, of the cash or the currency is what you're doing into labor and lumber. So that's a possibility. Or it could be something else as simple as this where they loan the money. Okay. The bad guys loan the money to the builder. The builder builds the church, right, at the end of the day, and then refinances it, whatever, get the get whatever money back and pays back the their original lender. Got it. Okay. So you could like you could build a bunch of property, sell the property, and that's getting the good money back into your pocket, essentially. Like yeah. you pay for the materials with the bad money, and then you okay. Let me let sense. me I'll give you a prime example. Let's assume that you have the cartel. The cartel is in Mexico. The cartel has a bank in Mexico. Your construction guy gets a loan from the Bank of Mexico, right? He gets his loan from the Bank of Mexico. He makes his payments, but he makes his payments to the Bank of Colombia, right? That the other cartel also owns. So he's getting money from in, coming in and going out. But on the surface, it looks like a regular loan. It's not real. It's real loan. It's true, but it's loan from drug money. And so on the surface, on the paper, it looks like just one bank, you know, lending money and then somebody getting repaid back. Hmm. Okay. That's all. That's also a possibility. Now, I've also seen that it to sense. where you have, I'll give you an example. It's called trade-based money laundering. You can do this a little bit in the construction business, but it's usually heavy equipment. You have, um, let's say the, dr the drugs come out of Columbia and it's, let's say it's crack cocaine. Crack cocaine gets sold on the streets in New York City. All right, Thomas, I right turn, I right turn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So you, they get paid in $20 bills and $10 bills. So the $20 and $10 bills are all combined together in nice big bundles. And what do they do? They buy, they go out and buy heavy excavation equipment. 
you know, the 200, 300, 500,000 dollar pieces of equipment. That equipment then goes, gets shipped, gets purchased in cash, gets shipped down to Columbia, right? And then it's sold. So what you've done, you've taken the drug money, you've turned it into construction equipment. And then when someone opens up a case, you know, going from New York to Columbia, they open up the big container, it's excavation equipment. That's not illegal to mm. have, right? So the, what they've done is they've, they've changed the form of the currency to construction equipment. And so Got it goes it. down and goes into Columbia and then they can either use it or they can sell it for whatever, whatever they do. It's called trade-based money laundry. Because if you had a big shipment full of cash going from Long Island to uh, Columbia, people are like, oh, that's got to be drug money. No one ships cash in big containers like this. But shipping cranes and bobcats, no big deal. All right, so let's switch gears back to the good guys because I know that we've got a lot of good guys listening to this podcast and they might be sitting here going, oh my gosh, I never want to I never want to cross the desk of a, a IRS criminal uh, or even auditor in general. What are some things that an honest taxpayer can implement to just ensure that everything's buttoned up, their T's are crossed, their I's are dotted? I mean, w- what are the situations where you've gone in and you're just like, oh yeah, this is like, an honest taxpayer. And if they had done these different things differently, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Well, for the most IRS criminal investigators are not auditors. They do have accounting backgrounds and they carry guns and have badges. They're accounting nerds with guns. That's really what they are. Okay. They trace the money very, very well. It's all they do is white collar tracing the money. So they're very good at it. Usually, almost always, and it's very hard to have one contrary to this, is that if there is a criminal investigation that's opened up and someone's being looked at, there has to be an obvious disparity between that lifestyle and tax return. Let me give an example. A construction owner who owns a million-dollar house, but yet he reports $10,000 a year on his tax return. There is a big disparity between those two numbers, right? So obviously there is a problem. The question is now, how bad, how big is the problem? How big is the dollar amount? Because the dollar amount is what runs a train when it comes to sentencing. And it makes sense. If you commit tax evasion of $100,000, should you get more or less time than the guy who commits tax evasion of a million dollars? You're going to get less time, almost always. The judges have, have, have discretion, but they have a little chart. A million dollars gives you so much time. $100,000 gives you so much time. Every defense attorney knows what this chart looks like. Okay. It's not a matter of an individual gets knocked on the door by an Irish criminal investigator and says, excuse me, do you have a receipt for that underwear that you donated to Goodwill? They're not going to do that. There's a big difference between the tax return or lack of tax return and this lifestyle. You know, that's really what they're looking for. Now, that's the criminal side. The civil side is just part of what you already know. It's just keep your books and records and keep receipts. You know, so the IRS comes in and says, uh, do you have a receipt for that? Yeah, I do right here. There you go. That's what it is. It's easy peasy. And they'll be out of your hair. They'll, they'll move on and, and go on to some other, some other person. But if okay. you get knocked on the door with a criminal no. investigator, there's usually 100% a huge problem between your tax return and your lifestyle. That makes sense. I saw Tom react, so I want to get his reaction here in a second. But... You all heard Robert just say you need bookkeeping, okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in a roundabout way. So, by the way, we offer bookkeeping services, not to say that this is a big ad, but get good bookkeeping services. Because, I mean, I don't even know how you make financial decisions without solid bookkeeping services anyway. But that those bookkeeping services will hold you accountable to, on a monthly basis, documenting your transactions, recording your receipts, uh, and hopefully staying out of hot water at some later point. But, Tom, you had a reaction on zoom here. So I want to see what were you going to chime in and try to say? Yeah. You know, I mean, we've, we've seen this before in our sales process. People will, will have a lifestyle that's just not, not lining up with the income that they're (laughs) saying they have or what their tax returns say that they have. And they, they're usually very defensive about it. They won't give you information. So when I heard that, I was just like, I've seen this before. It's not too surprising. So I think we've already covered it here. It's like at the end of the day, bookkeeping is important. Keeping uh, good books and records is important, not only to make decisions for your business, but to prevent issues, you know, with the IRS in general, you don't want to, you don't want to get, you know, two, three, four years down the line and have a big cleanup project where you haven't filed tax returns and someone's trying to piece together a P&L for you. Cause it sounds like these are the type of issues that could land you in, in hot water. 
So, you know, be diligent to be a professional, right? Uh, if you're going to be in business, do the right thing, get your bookkeeping in order, get your taxes in order and uh, do things the right way. When your CPA tells you, Hey, look, you need to track your miles. You need to track your receipts. We're not doing this to be a pain or you need to track your hours or something along those lines. We're doing this to protect you and, and put you on the right side of the track. And uh, yes, it's tedious. Yes, some of the stuff is annoying, but it's part of doing business. If you want to be in business, you have to do these things. If you don't want to deal with this stuff, just go get a job and you don't have to worry about that stuff, right? You get your W-2, you put it on your tax return, you call it a day. But if you're going to be- Dude, business, that is such a good point. If you don't want to deal with the administrative pieces of running a business, then don't run a business. <laughs> get a job or scale your business up to a point where you can hire out the services needed for all that back end office admin work because it, it's one of those funny things where people don't realize it's important until they need it uh, until you're talking to Robert. <laughs> well right? there are there are two things that you said Thomas that struck me. Number one is any CPA return preparer who's been in the business long enough has had these clients where they walk in and they're like you ain't living off that amount. We all know you're not living off of that amount. It does not make sense. Now, the question becomes then, as a return preparer, do I keep them as a client when my gut instinct is they're lying on this tax return or they're taking deductions that, frankly, we all know they're just eh, crying off lie, right? And we have an, an obligation, code of ethics, not only from our old CPA boards, but as well as with the IRS and the Office of Professional Responsibility, Circle 230, regarding preparing those tax returns where we think there could, be, there could be a problem. That's number one. Number two is you, and you've probably seen quite a bit of this, and we talk about the property flippers, where they just walk in and they haven't done tax returns in five or six years. What most people don't realize this is that failing to file a tax return is a crime. If you are required to file a tax return, which means you make over you know X dollars, right, the standard deduction, you are required to file a tax return, and not doing so is a misdemeanor, and misdemeanor is up to one year in prison. Now, here's the kicker. If an individual has failed to file a tax return for year one, he can get the one year in prison. If he does it in second year and, fail, and fails to file, the judge has the option. Do I stack it or run it concurrently? So the judge can say, oh, you're, going, you're still going to get one year, or if the judge is really ticked off at you, he can say, you know what? You're getting two years. And this is what happened with um, Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes was found guilty of failing to file a tax return for multiple years, and the judge stacked it on him. So he just didn't get one year total. He got one year, then another year, then another year. And he got a couple of years out of all this just for failing to file tax returns. And that's kind of like, uh, I, I presume, public figure, make a statement sort of thing or set the example. Well, so yes, it like, can. Like, yes, it can be. Or it's as simple as the property flipper who hasn't filed tax returns in five years. If he's made $100,000 a year, you know, flipping properties, that's $500,000 of unreported income. Uh, that probably will get you $100,000 in tax easily. Well, that'll get you straight on the, uh, you know, on the radar screen for IRS for investigations for a tax case. I think we should clarify for everybody listening to that filing an extension is not this right you can file an extension by april 15th and then you have until october 15th to file your tax return and you're still good i think a lot of people you know we we all went to school we had deadlines and we were forced to meet those deadlines so we built these habits around meeting deadlines at all costs and i think a lot of people think that miss that filing an extension is a bad thing but it's not a bad thing. It gives you extra time to figure it out. It gives your firm, your CPA firm, some extra time to figure it out, especially in today's world where demand for CPAs is extremely high, but supply is extremely low. So extensions are not bad, but you got to still file by that October 15th deadline. Right, because what you're doing, you're lawfully extending the date due. That's that's, that's all you're doing. And so, But when that date due is passed, then that becomes the crime. So October 16th, 18th, November, whatever else it is, you know, that's the crime. What if you are in a refund situation? Still a crime? It is a crime, but where is the jury appeal when so you sit there and say, ladies and gentlemen, jury, put this guy in prison because he's owed a $100,000 refund. We didn't file a tax return. The jury's going to look at you going, you're stupid. You know, <laughs> wait, where are you bringing this, like, bringing this in front of us? The guy's doing a refund. He doesn't owe any money. So mm -hmm. there you go. So it becomes a, 
it becomes a jury appeal issue. It's technically still a crime, but still a, but a jury appeal issue. That makes sense. So what are some like questions that tax professionals can ask to try to avoid taking on like criminal clients? What's the uh, that pre-engagement process? Or what are some things that we can kind of look at to try to assess, is this person going to be somebody that is not good? or And or if we accidentally onboard somebody like that, because we didn't ask the right questions up front, and we later discover like we're going through that tax preparation process, what do we do at that point? The easiest way to to answer that question is go by the circular 230 in your board of your ethics board about what do you do when someone is not has you just have the suspicion that they're just not being honest with you and candid with you. To me, I just disengage it. That's just me. But, you know, there's always going to be that client that wants to push the envelope. And sometimes they do push the envelope and it may not be a crime. It's just they're just pushing the envelope, which is fine. Everybody's allowed to do that. It's a civil issue. That's not a criminal issue. What becomes a criminal issue is when you as a return preparer know that they are not filing the tax return properly or with, you know, with uh, with the correct numbers. In particular, if you know it, not only just a gut instinct. But you also know that they've told you something and you decided to hide it from the IRS as well. Like, don't report all this income or put the extra deduction on, on something here when you know that it wasn't truthful or lawful. That's when you start getting yourself into a, into the mix of participating in the crime and not just being a witness going, eh, they gave me the documents, you put it down. It's no big deal as a return prepared to be a good witness. But, you know, if I had a client, and we've, we've all had these clients before, I prepared tax returns as a small firm CPA, small CPA firm for years. We've all had these clients that come in and just scratch your head going, really? You know, you just got to make that gut call. Do I keep them or not? If it's a consistent basis, then you look at it from the standpoint of, do I, is it really worth the hassle? Because trust me, if IRSCI comes knocking on your door and asks you to be a witness, you're going to be spending a lot of time with the CI agent, number one, you're going to spend a lot of time in court. It's going to take whatever fee you charge for this stuff is just not going to be worth your time at all for these types of clients. Just not. If you you remember the uh, the Chrisleys, right? The Chrisleys were real estate, I think, investors at one point in time. And they were also these reality TV show people. Their CPA went to prison. I think his fee was like thirty six or forty thousand dollars. And he went to prison for more than one year, I think a couple of years. I don't know if it would be worth $40,000 fee for me to go to prison for a couple of years. It's Just not. not. It's not. But the, but in this situation, he did. You know? And you got a CPA who did it. Yeah. That's rough. That's rough. Sounds like when clients are, when you as a CPA or if you're a tax preparer and you hear that your client's being disingenuous with you, they're not paying the, the right amount of taxes, it's better just to disengage rather than, than continue on with the engagement because you're putting yourself at tremendous risk, not only for your potential time you might lose through having to go through the investigation, but you might actually serve jail time. There's probably no amount of money that's really worth probably the jail time <laughs> that, that you would get. Um, so. No, if you got your client to ask you to lie, that's an automatic no from me. Right. It's just right. an automatic no. Yeah, not having it. All right. All right. So that, no, this is good information to have. So wrapping up with the final question here, at what point should a taxpayer or perhaps a firm engage someone like yourself in the process of when this happens? My initial reaction is if a CPA calls me up and says, Robert, I'm in trouble, my immediate reaction is going to be, you need to get an attorney and let's get an attorney to get, right, let me recommend you one if you need one. And then we'll go from there. Because if I need to help a CPA who potentially is a target of a criminal investigation, that I want that attorney client privilege where I can have candid conversations with their defense attorney. And then we can do the best deal possible and see what's going on and, and see what we can do for them. That would be my initial reaction to them for doing so. Because I'm a CPA. I don't have attorney client privilege when my client comes in, any type of client comes in and tells me stuff. So I want to protect them from any potential issues. I don't want to be a witness, you know. So uh, that would be my recommendation. Go get a defense attorney. And if the defense attorney needs some help, then I'm here to help. If listeners want to get in touch with you for whatever reason, perhaps maybe they're experiencing some of these issues or whatever the case may be, uh, what would be the best way for them to do so? There's a couple of ways. I have my website, nordlandercpa.com. 
I also have written two books that are Amazon bestsellers. One's called Unpaid Payroll Taxes, A Time Bomb You Can Diffuse. And that's really all about unpaid payroll taxes because un- we didn't talk about this, but unpaid payroll taxes is a crime. Taking money out of people's paychecks and not turning it over is a crime. And the government treats it that way. And the other one's called Criminal Tax Secrets, What Every Defense Attorney Should Know. And that's the book for defense attorneys to know how to evaluate a case when it goes from a civil issue to a criminal issue in the various stages in a criminal investigation, how to best evaluate it. It's really my wisdom in a, you know, maybe 150 pages about how to handle a case like that. And the third thing is, it's also going to be uh, my podcast. I have a podcast called the Fraud Fighter Podcast, and my audience is those who are interested in the anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, and the forensic accounting industry. So that's my audience. Awesome. Awesome. So what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and drop that information into the show notes for anybody who's interested in checking out the books, checking out the podcast, or getting in contact uh, with Robert, learning more there. Robert, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your wisdom with us. Now we, we know some things that are definitely... Uh, that we'll definitely have to watch out for. And uh, hopefully everybody who's listened today takes this stuff seriously and understands that filing your tax returns is important. It's it's a crime if you don't. And also uh, kind of just the importance of record keeping and doing things the right way so you don't end up in a criminal investigation. Very true. Very true. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate the time.